Hey, good morning, Vantage Point Church. Tom and I are super sad that we can't be with you guys this morning because we are celebrating one of our church plant, Renovate Church's fourth anniversary this morning. Come on. They planted right in the beginning of COVID and God's favor has just been upon them. So we are super excited for them. But I'm also excited for us today because one of our sons is home. Jay Stovall, one of our church planters who planted Portrait Church just recently in Redlands, California. They have been absolutely killing it. I still remember the first time I met Jay. Jay was just a single young adult, and yet every time uh, we met, he was so teachable, so earnest. I could tell that he really wanted to follow God's will in everything that he did. And right now, he has just grown and grown and grown in that attribute. So I am so excited for his first time away from Portrait Church to be with us here at Vantage Point. Church family, would you give him a warm Vantage Point welcome this morning? Well, good morning. Man, the Apostle Paul, he has this opening line in the book of Philippians where he says, he's talking to the church in Philippi, and he says, I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of the partnership of the gospel from the first day until now. That's been my prayer um, with you all here. Every time I think of Vantage Point Church, I seriously thank God for you. I thank God for this community. I think of you with such joy. Um, like, this is the first time I'm away from our, uh, our home church, but this still feels like I'm coming back home in some senses, too, for us. Many of you have, have prayed for us. You have supported us. You have helped my family pay off medical bills. Like, you have uh, sent, uh, you, have, you have physically gone and helped serve at a service so that we can um, embrace our community. Like all the success stories, I really hope you know that you are playing an intentional part uh, of our story if you call this your home church. And if those of you that have, maybe you don't know who I am and you're like, but Vantage Point is your home church, I want to say and encourage you that you made a really good decision um, because this church cares about the good news of Jesus going all throughout the Inland Empire and the nations, not just here in Eastville and the surrounding community. So I want to thank you and honor you before I start this morning. Um, and also, it's kind of like a little elephant in the room, right? It's like I came to talk about marriage, and you're like, well, what if I'm single? What if I'm, what if I'm widowed? What if I'm divorced? What if um, I have hopes of being uh, married, and I don't see that happening here in the future because the male pool here at Vantage Point is slim? <laughs> All I want to say to you is if you drive 30 minutes, I got about four good guys lined up. <laughs> just saying, just saying. But here's the tension with that that I just want to encourage all of you with in this room that we all fall under this umbrella. Is that Jesus is called the groom and his church is called the bride. And one day, I love, Pastor Tom asked a question. He said, one day your marriage here on earth will end. But can I tell you what marriage won't end? The marriage that's not going to end is the marriage that Jesus has always been after with his bride, his connection to his bride, his covenant to his bride, his church people. So if you're single in here, if you're divorced, if you're widowed and you feel a little like just sitting in the tension of sitting in a marriage series, can I tell you that, that we serve a God who is making all things new and he's coming after his bride. He's coming back and he's going to have a honeymoon called paradise that ain't going to end for you. And so I want to encourage you with that. I want to let you know God sees you. Um, Many of you, if you've never met me, you know, um, you wouldn't know this if you've never met me. But if you did meet me before, you would know that my father-in-law is none other than Pastor Tom. Some of you, uh, like, you kind of chuckle, like, nervously. And so do I still sometimes. If we're on the same page, but you know, that's my father-in-law, which means my wife who just uh, got to sing up here as well. um, I had the privilege of asking for her hand in marriage. Um, We've been married, but what most people don't know 
And the, the question that Tom posed last week is, how will your marriage end? What most people don't know with my wife and I is there is actually a moment uh, a month before marriage that I actually didn't even know we were actually going to get married. So I wouldn't be able to ask the question, how will the marriage end? Because at that moment, I thought it was going to end before it started. I was sitting at, at on the border, Limonite Avenue. Across from me is my father-in-law, Tom, mother-in-law, Tracy, Tiff, my, uh, we're engaged at the time, a month before a marriage, and here I am in this conversation, and I thought that we were no longer going to get married at the end of this conversation. I'll tell you why. There was something that I was not being 100% honest about, and, and in my mind and heart, I was like, well, I, I've kind of let her know a little bit, but you know how you just start, you start reasoning with yourself, like, oh, it's a little bit, but it ain't all the bit. And I wasn't fully transparent with my wife about how much student debt that I actually had. So final second to last premarital counseling session, it comes out. Here I am sitting across the table with my father-in-law, Tom, crying and in tears because here I am exposed. I think that's what, that, that, that's sometimes like what we don't realize like when we hide stuff is that eventually it gets exposed. And it just happened to get exposed for me at on the border, and the tears were not because the salsa was hot. It was because your boy was exposed. And I sat in that moment, and here's the thing. I had heard all the tips about marriage. I had heard all the things like the love languages and the weekly date nights and the affirmations. But what I didn't have was something that needed to transform my soul because in that moment, the thing that I was carrying, the thing that I was hiding was called shame. You can get all the tips and not be transformed. And my hope this morning is that you wouldn't just hear tips, but you would hear good news that will hopefully transform your soul, transform your marriage. Because at the end of the day, we all in this room struggle with this thing called sin that produces this thing called shame. Whether you want to admit it or not. I actually think part of the shame that you're experiencing is the fact that you won't admit it because there's something that you're carrying. But I was exposed, and if we want to know how our marriages will end, I think a good place to start is to look at the first marriage that's written in Scripture. Because this idea of shame, the Bible doesn't take a whole lot of time to introduce us to. Yeah, it actually introduces us, uh, this idea within the first three chapters. The first marriage, God would step out onto nothing, he would speak to nothing, and something would happen. The, the universe would be created, the stars, the moon, he would separate dark from light, waters, animals, all this stuff. But then he does something radically different. He doesn't speak, but he gets down and he grabs dirt and he breathes into the nostrils of man. And he creates man. And just like everything else he had set up until this point, he said it's really good. It's really good. But the one thing he, he says, he makes a turn and says, this not good is that this brother is by himself. So he's my, my version. You ain't going to find that in the Bible. That's the African-American vernacular version. He said this is not good for him to be alone. And so we see in Genesis 2.18, it says, the Lord said, it's not good for this man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So he puts him to sleep, takes out the rib. All of a sudden, this woman is formed, Eve. And listen to what uh, Adam says, Genesis 2.22. He's like, this is now bones of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was, she was taken out of man. And if I can contextualize it, I imagine this scene being like a 90s R&B video and you got like light spotlight. It's like this lavender fluorescent light. And then there's like wind from nowhere and Eve's hair is blowing because that's it because she ain't got nothing else on. And, and Adam's like, Alexa, play There Goes My Baby by Usher. It's like, here she comes. And he's just excited. But listen to what happens here. It says in Genesis 2 verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked and say it with me, they felt no shame. They felt no shame. And here's why. Everything God had created up until this point was good, really good. Humanity was created for connection, for peace, for joy with God and each other. So everything was good until a conversation happens. 
And this conversation happens with the deceiver. This conversation happens with the accuser and the liar. And Satan comes in and he has this sidebar conversation. And how he starts this conversation out is so important that you need to get deep down into your soul. Because what he's trying to do here radically shifted everything. He, at, he tell, the, the very first question he asks Eve, did God really say? Did he really say? What he's doing is not, he's not coming with a sword. He's not coming with an army. He's coming with a lie. Did God really say? All of a sudden it would lead down to this trickle effect of, of Satan trying to deceive Eve, not just trying, succeeding. So much so that Eve in this moment would think that the best option would be to do the very one thing that God said would not be good to do. He said everything was good. This one tree in the middle, though, ah, that's the one you need to stay away from. The only, but everything else, y'all. So she thinks in this moment the only option that she has, and now that, that she and Adam have, is to eat of this from this forbidden tree. And then what happens? It says in Genesis 3, 7, the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. In literally a matter of verses, they went from experiencing no shame to now covering themselves because of shame. In a matter of verses, this, what happened in this moment it's all of the goodness, all of the things that God had declared over humanity and the relationship with him was stripped and, and humans and humanity is now vulnerable. Vulnerable. Kurt Thompson in his book called The Soul of Shame says, this is why we wear clothes, live in houses, have speed limits. So much of what we do in life is designed, among other things, to protect us from the fact that we are vulnerable at all times. To be human it's to be vulnerable. This act of rebellion against the goodness of God and God's good plans made the rest of humanity vulnerable to sin, evil, and now shame. And the symbol that was produced because of this, what they did in response to this, were to make fig leaves. Now, we may chuckle at that. We may think, well, yeah, they probably didn't have like a seamstress, so I guess figs were the only thing. But you and I both know how to make modern day fig leaves. We know how to cover ourselves up because of shame that we are experiencing. But it doesn't always look like how we think it looks. Because especially, can I, can I be honest? Especially if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you know how to cover yourself with fig leaves that may seem spiritual. You know how to say all the right things, quote all the Bible verses, but there's still something that you're covering. There's still some sort of shame that you're covering because what I have learned is oftentimes the things that we are trying to pursue and be successful at are, are a result of some form of shame that we're not dealing with. The reason why you want to climb the corporate ladder could also be not because you want to provide for your family, but because you have shame that your parents didn't give you any worth or validity. Maybe your father was not around. So you think if I climb this, this corporate ladder, if I make all this money, then maybe then... I will be good. Maybe then I will be worth something. Maybe then if I do this, I will be successful. The reason why some of you got the big house is not because you want to be hospitable, but because the shame wants you to try and keep up with the Joneses. You spend money on that card, the money that you ain't got, because the shame says, what if people realize I don't got it? You struggle with pornography, not because, not because you necessarily enjoy it, but I also think there's some level of shame that you're experiencing, especially in marriage that you think, I'm not going to be satisfied here. Or maybe, maybe uh, I have stuff going on inside of me that I don't think I can satisfy the other person. So I have to go to this for some sort of relief and release. There's something deep down inside all of us that if we are not honest, we will end up trying to be successful at things just because of shame, not because God calls us. Same thing in marriage. We have built fig leaves, and it showed up in the first marriage here because they did three things. They hid, they blamed, and they denied. They hid, they blamed, and they denied. The first thing they did, the very first question, y'all, the very first question that God would ask humanity was this. Where are you? Where are you? 
They were hiding. For some reason, I, I just find it fascinating. They knew that the creator of the heavens and earth created everything, created them, yet they still felt like they could hide from him. <laughs> like, you know how silly? But that's what shame and that's what sin will make you do. It'll make you do things and hide in places that you think you cannot be found in. But guess what? God finds you. And that's what happens here. And the other thing that happened that I find fascinating is that when they were hiding, what they were simultaneously doing when they were hiding was it impacted and changed their view of God's character. Because God said everything was good. God meant for peace, for harmony, for joy. This word scripture called shalom. Why would they hide from a good God? Unless you're just sitting in your shame. You're sitting in your sin. Then they would go and blame. Genesis 3.12, it says, when God's like, did y'all eat from the thing that I told you not to eat from? And here comes Adam and, well, God, it was the woman that you gave me. It was her. She got it, and then I guess I ate it. All of a sudden, he went from Usher to playing Shaggy. It wasn't me. All of a sudden. Oh, Adam, it's not your fault. It's the woman's fault. The one woman that you was feeling a couple verses ago, all of a sudden you won't put her out on the streets. Can, can you just imagine, like, something I had to imagine this week. What if, what if, what if, that the very first question listed between God and humanity was not God asking humanity where you were, but humanity asking God, where are you? Why? Because they weren't hiding. What, just what if for that moment they didn't sit in blame, but they were like, you know what, you know what, man, God, where are you? We messed up. Like, it's on, what if Adam was like, it's on me, God, I don't know where you at. You're going to come out these skies one of these moments? God, it's on me. I just want to let you know. But he didn't do that. He blamed. He refused to take ownership and follow and admit the truth. And that's what shame does. Shame begins to tell a story. And I believe in this moment, not only did they hide, not only did they blame and not take responsibility, but they denied the truth. They denied the fact that God had created everything for goodness and that they had messed up. They had not taken responsibility. This whole idea of denial is a refusal to admit the truth. They did not admit the very first, in that very first moment with God. There was no admitting that, you know what, it was, it was on us. It was on me. Like, we're not hiding here. We're just going to stand out here. We're not going to deny this. But we messed up. They didn't do that. They denied God. And now shame enters the story. And I believe, I believe this whole idea of shame entering did not simply just happen when they looked and said, oh my gosh, we naked up in here. I don't think that was the moment. I actually think it started in Eve's mind when Satan was telling her there's something off between you and God here. He's holding out on you. He's holding out. This thing that he says is good is actually not good. This person that he had you get connected with and married to, they ain't the person. You begin to believe lies and what happened, shame covered up and actually, actually messed up a relationship between Adam and Eve. And why didn't they have a little powwow? Hey, hey, Eve, Eve, what's he saying? What's he saying? Uh-uh, no, nah, that's not the God that we serve. He just said a couple verses ago, everything was good not to eat that. But something happened in the mind. And after the shame and the disconnection of what was barrier there between God and humanity that Satan planted, now all of a sudden becomes a reality. And so that's what shame does. It tells a story that's not true and absent often of God. And can I tell you what the remedy for shame is? The remedy for disappointment and, and di navigating sin and sitting in your shame. The remedy that I had to experience on Limonite Avenue at On the Border was vulnerability through confession. Vulnerability through confession. There's two forms of confession I want us to just take an honest look at. The first one is to acknowledge or admit. Confession is possibly, um, especially in the context of Scripture and the Bible, it's in the context of something that can be contested or denied with the goal of getting to the truth. Confession is all about can we get to the truth of the matter here? Because the world, we love to live on the surface, but God's like, I'm trying to get to the truth because I'm trying to transform your heart. See, you can get all the marriage tactics and the tips and still not be transformed. 
What happens when the shame arises? What happens when the conflict arises? Paul David Tripp says that no change takes place in marriage that does not begin with confession. No change, especially the change that we're looking for. Confession, I believe, is like the doorway. You arrive at a destination where you can be honest about what is truly going on. But here's the thing. There are many reasons why you and I don't confess, and it's found in this first marriage story. We don't confess because we would rather hide. We'd rather hide. For some reason, I think if we were honest, we struggle with the lie, and we believe the lie that hiding in our shame feels safer than revealing and confessing what's truly going on. Like, again, why did they think that they needed to hide from God? Because the shame and the lie that the, the enemy revealed to them was that God wasn't safe. And I think that's what happens. Sometimes we feel like it's safer to hide from God than go to the one who is the miracle worker. But hiding doesn't often produce hope because hiding is tied to hopelessness. When you hide, you think, man, I, I can't reveal this. I can't talk about this. Like, what would happen? You, 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 you start building a narrative of shame of how that person's going to receive you and, the distri- and what could happen. But can I tell you that confession is tied to hope? You confess, you get to the truth. Because Jesus said it's the truth that will set you free. Hiding, it only prolongs the thing that's going to be exposed. It's the truth that sets you free. When we confess and we build a culture and habit of confessing our sin and not hiding it and even revealing our shame, we go from hiding to revealing. And oftentimes we go from hiding to being honest. Ephesians 4, 25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off all falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, to one another, for we are all members of one body. Proverbs 28, 13 says, People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. You see, mercy is on the other side of confession. But when you conceal, there is no prospering. There is no flourishing of a marriage. Many of you, you've gotten so good at concealing. You've gotten so good at hiding that you can't be found. You know, like, I, it's, and it's not even like this. Like, I play, my kids have gotten really good at hide and seek, so much so that we play hide and seek for 20 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, I can't find y'all. Like, Man, y'all really good. But that's often, I think, what happens in marriage. You just got so good at hiding that your partner stopped looking for you. You got so good, I give up. Stop looking. You can't heal what you won't reveal. You cannot heal what you won't reveal. And you're sitting in the anxiety, I can see it in some of your faces right now, you're sitting in the anxiety of what would happen if I actually revealed this thing and the lie from the enemy says there's gonna be no healing. But I have, I have, I have a truth for you that I'm gonna get to later today. And the second thing we tend to do that keeps us from confession is blaming. Like you cannot grow in love and affection towards your spouse in your relationships with people if you are constantly like making a checklist of all the things that you can blame them for. Some of y'all even did that this morning. Shoot, well, we didn't get here on time because of her. If she would have just put that on, if we would have got the kids ready, it's her fault, right? We, like we subconsciously build this list of how we blame other people. And while you're doing that, you cannot simultaneously grow in love and affection towards them. 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love keeps no records of wrongs. Imagine how healing that would be for some of y'all marriages. But can I, can, I just want to do a quick caveat. I did this for, I felt like the Lord, I put it on my heart. I know that some of you here You experience shame, you've experienced hardship because of physical, spiritual, and even emotional manipulative abuse in your marriages. That's why you're, that's why it ended in divorce. That's why it ended in a lawsuit. That's why it ended in a police report. And I just, I I felt like God had given me a word this morning to say, you are not to blame. That we serve a God who is and will make all things new. So you can find hope. But God also doesn't want you as a result of other people's sin to have you still hiding, to have you still blaming. He wants to set you free. 
And the reality is blaming can often make us dictators. It can make us defensive, which will eventually lead to destruction. Something gets brought up about you and you're like, well, that's not me. If you just would have done this, I wouldn't have done this. And we get defensive. But here's the thing. When you build a habit of confession where you are honest about the sin that's in you, you shift the focus off of the other person and back onto you. And then the third thing that keeps us from confession is is denying. And then when you start confessing, you shift off the focus of the other person and onto you. And there's no more denying this greater humility that's produced. One of the mistaken traps that human beings fall into is believing that our greatest problem exists outside of us rather than inside of us. So many in life and marriage just deny the reality that if you really looked in the mirror and you'd humble yourself, you'd realize that you are weak, that you are not as strong as you think you are, that you need more humility. I wonder how many marriages in this room would be fixed today if you just said, my greatest marital problem is me. Is me. I'm not going to hide. I'm not going to blame my sin onto the other person. I'm not going to deny the reality that there's stuff inside of me that's not like Jesus. Not denied it anymore. And if in this moment you're feeling a sense of shame, can I tell you you're under a different gospel? Because the gospel of Jesus says this that my grace is sufficient. For you, that his power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, we can boast more gladly about our weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. When we don't deny, we deny humility. So when we confess, what we are doing is we are saying what the great theologian Michael Jackson says, that I'm starting with the man in the mirror. And I'm asking him to change his ways. We have to start with us. And confession leads us from denying to greater humility. And can I tell you the secret power, this is a secret power of confession. It's found in James 5.16. It says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confession brings healing. But somewhere along the line, and I think If I'm being honest, being a part of a new church, I'm hearing a very similar narrative of people who are giving church one more chance. It's because they have dealt with things and they had confessed things to Christian people or churches and they didn't find healing, they found condemnation. I'm all for Christians having convictions. We have them, we should. But can I tell you what I think is gonna transform the world? It's when people look at Christians and we are known more for our confession, more even than some of our convictions. When we are known for our confession that we are weak, that we don't handle marriage like we should all the time, that there's stuff in Jesus that's not yet in us. If we are just honest with our world and we have a posture of confession, even more than we have with some of our convictions, I think that's one of the keys to transforming what we see in the world and often what we see in our marriages. And my charge for you as a community is that healing is not a one-time scenario. Confession is not a one-time scenario. In Hebrews, it says, encourage one another as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. My question for some of you as followers of Jesus Do you create spaces for people to bring their confession? Do you create safe places for people to do that? Do they leave more encouraged or more condemned? I imagine that there's many marriages here who probably, yes, they're they're struggling in shame, but if all they see you walking around like you just got the perfect marriage and you don't create spaces for people to bring their person, then I think you're not going to experience the healing power of Jesus here. I love this whole idea of being living proof of a loving God. And you know what's what's good about living proof? Is that the only reason you and I live is because of what Jesus has done for us. So the proof is in the fact that we have confessed that he is Lord, that we are not. His way is good. Our ways don't end up that way. Same thing in your marriage. Here's the key, I believe. If confession 
is the key, if confession is the doorway, then I believe repentance is now the new path that we walk on. Because confession is not a one-time thing, it's a lifestyle. Repentance is not a one-time thing, it's a lifestyle. Romans 2, 4 says, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Or in the New Living Translation, it says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? The whole idea of confession is you step up to the doorway and you say, you know what? I just need to bring this. I need to confess that how I'm doing this, what I'm hiding, what I'm blaming you for, what I'm denying. I need to confess and bring that to truth and to light. And then repentance is I'm no longer going this way. I'm going to turn and I'm now going to walk in the way of Jesus. In our marriage, in my life, in my relationships, I am going to confess, but I'm also going to turn. Because some of y'all know what it's like to be in a relationship with someone who confesses and it's like, bro, ain't nothing changed. You talk a good talk, but there's no walk. You can't just simply have confession unless you repent, unless you make up your mind and say, you know what? The way of Jesus is so much better than the way I've been traveling. Because the way of Jesus brings healing. It brings life. The second form of confession that I want to leave you with today in the Hebrew is called yada. And this sort of confession is an expression of praise and thanksgiving. And I want to, I want to invite you to a moment of yada right now. Because the truth of the good news of Jesus is Adam and Eve sinned. They allowed shame in. They allowed vulnerability and devastation. And listen to what God does in Genesis 3.21. It says, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. The moral of this story, y'all, is that God will always cover you better than you can cover yourself. The fig leaves that you are creating are going to bring more shame, are going to bring more hiding, are going to bring more blame, are going to be more denying. We serve a God who rescued you, who loved you so much that he not only clothed you, he sent his son. And it says in scripture that Jesus was stripped of his clothes in the most vulnerable position to pay for your sins and for my sins. And it's hard to believe because it takes so much faith to believe in that. And it takes so much faith to believe that God will actually cover you better than you will cover yourself. But he's always said that. He's always believed that. And so my encouragement for you today is to stop hiding. Stop blaming. And stop denying the truth. Because Jesus said it's the truth, my friends, for your marriages, for your relationship that will set you free. Let's pray. God, my prayer this morning is that we would stop putting hope in ourselves and in our own strength and in tactics and in tips, but we would put our hope on the good news of Jesus, that even though we sinned and we're separated from a holy God, you decided to cover us better through the blood of your own son. And my prayer today is that people would experience that fully and have faith in that and walk in freedom in their marriages because we are in a watching world who doesn't need our own strength. God, I know for myself that oftentimes I want to make things feel like I have it all together to my wife and to even friends because sometimes I want to be the hero of the story. But God, when we confess, when we admit our weakness, we make Jesus the hero. And my prayer is that this community, that people who engage with Vantage Point, that people would leave more impressed with Jesus than them. That there would be marriages that were healed and restored. And people would leave more impressed with Jesus because of the confession and healing that happened in marriages in this place. So, Lord, we give you praise and we thank you for being a God who can cover us way better than we can cover ourselves. Amen.